Are you leaving money on the table? It's a question that I've been asked over the years by a number of people in this industry, and it's one I, one I do grapple with a lot. So today I'm talking to Ryan Saylor from Beyond, and we're discussing how dynamic pricing can create a better strategy for your business overall. So listen up. This is the Vacation Rental Success Podcast, keeping you up to date with news, views, information and resources on this rapidly changing short-term rental business. I'm your host, Heather Bayer, and with 25 years of experience in this industry, I'm making sure you know what's hot, what's not, what's new and what will help make your business a success. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of the Vacation Rental Success Podcast. This is your host, Heather Bayer, and as ever, delighted to be back with you and delighted to be back here in Gulf Shores after a brief trip up to Ontario last week. Went back for a meeting and also to help my uh, eight-year-old granddaughter celebrate her birthday. So it was lovely. Not so lovely being back in the snow. But it is going and um, we will be actually heading home back to Ontario in about five weeks time. And, you know, you get to that point where you start looking forward to the next stage in life. And my next stage in life is, is back home and spending spring and summer back in my house, which will be terrific. But I just wanted to share something I I experienced on that trip home. And I did talk about it briefly in the newsletter last week and mentioned it in the Elevate Summit where I shared a panel with uh, Jeannie Daly and Carol Sharoff and Amy Hynote, which was just a great experience. I think you can still get the recordings from the Elevate Summit. Just go across to breezeway.com and uh, and check that out. But anyway, the analogy came from the trip back where I did two legs. Uh, First leg was to from Pensacola to Charlotte and the second was Charlotte to Toronto. On the first leg, I had a business class seat. And even though, you know, business class on a tiny little aeroplane is nothing more than a little bit more legroom at the front of the aircraft and priority boarding, there, there is a palpable difference in the way that you're treated. You know, I sat down in my seat and after everybody else had boarded, the flight attendant came up and addressed me by my name, asked me what sort of drink I would like when we got airborne and asked if I was comfortable, which I was. And I ordered my drink and then once we were airborne, that was delivered. And then there was a constant stream of, of the flight attendant coming back and saying, is everything OK? Can I get you anything else? Which is all very pleasant. And on the next leg from Charlotte to Toronto, I was at the back of the bus. So really getting the sort of, you know, economy style service, you know, go sit down, will come past you at one point during the flight and offer you a cold cup of coffee and a packet of those really weird cookies, which actually are quite nice. The ones that sort of taste like, they have a sort of cinnamony taste. But anyway, that's, that's by the by. But the difference in the service was very, very marked, even in a domestic jet, you know, not flying international where it's, you know, you've got the lie flat seats and everything and you get a full meal off China plates. But I'm talking about the, the actual service, it's just it's what you get from the staff. And it made me really think about how unique our business is in that we treat our guests with excellent and personal service, regardless of what they pay. Nobody's telling us to go and treat somebody in a more special way just because they've paid $10,000 a week for their property. You know, you treat them differently than the ones that have paid 2000 a week for their property. So it, it just made me reflect on perhaps why our rental accommodation is so popular now that people don't feel that they're being singled out for paying less or paying more. And we treat everybody equally. Anyhow, that was was my thought from that. You know, and take it to hotels as well, because I've had experience in hotels and motels from lower end chains to the Ritz-Carlton. And there is generally a service difference there as well, dependent on what you pay. You know, not talking about the luxury aspects of the high-end hotels, but more in the way they, they, they treat their guests. So anyway, moving on to my guest today, 
and an announcement that we are so delighted to bring back Beyond as our primary sponsor for the next 10 weeks of the podcast. So Beyond have sponsored before. If you've listened to earlier episodes of the podcast where I was talking to Julie Brinkman, the CEO of Beyond, you will have heard the little segments that she was doing in the middle of interviews. We just broke for quick question. Well, we're doing the same now for the next 10 weeks after today's interview with Ryan Saylor, who's the Director of Partnerships at Beyond. It's really exciting for us because it's exciting for me because I love to learn about dynamic pricing. We were very, very late to the game of this. We've always had this set it and forget it approach. It's very common in our neck of the woods. That's what everybody does. And we've seen the light. We are seeing the light now and and looking at ways to assess supply, demand and adjust our prices accordingly. So super happy to have Beyond back as a sponsor of the podcast and even happier to have Ryan Saylor join me for a full interview on building a better pricing strategy. So without further ado, let's talk to Ryan. So today I am super excited to have with me Ryan Saylor, who's the Director of Partnerships at at Beyond. And we're going to talk today about building a better pricing strategy. And I'm super interested in this because, as I have said before, my own company has been very slow in coming to this place of, of revenue management and dynamic pricing. So every time I talk to the folks at Beyond, I'm learning something more. So hopefully in this discussion with Ryan, it's all going to come super clear. So thank you so much, Ryan, for joining me today. It's an absolute pleasure to have you with me. Thank you, Heather. And I will say you are not alone. So uh, (laughs) I hope I can help provide some some important information here and details on pricing and and dig into everything. But thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here as well. Well, it's it's interesting because I, you know, I certainly talked to some of my my colleagues up here in Ontario and, and it's not something that we've ever done. We've always had this set it and forget it attitude. And we're beginning, I mean, as, as I say, late coming to the market here, I'm beginning to see some movement in people wanting to know more about it. So I'm, I'm sure this conversation is really, really going to help. So can we kick off by just talking a little bit about your background uh, in the business? How did you get to where you are today as Director of Partnerships at Beyond? Yeah, absolutely. I love hearing about how people got to where they are in this industry because it's always a journey. So to share my own, I, uh, I actually went to school for hospitality. Uh, I was mainly focused on the hotel side, actually. So right after school, I went straight into hotel revenue management. I worked with Starwood at the time, who was then bought by Marriott, but started my revenue management career there. And then a couple of years later, moved into um, a company that did agnostic hotel revenue management reporting for different brands. So I learned a lot about the revenue management space in hotels, about the industry in general, and ultimately started to look for kind of a new challenge. Um, The hotel industry, the airline industry, car rentals, cruises, revenue management in those spaces are pretty mature, pretty set in their ways, not too much going on uh, in terms of a fast-paced environment. So I found out about Beyond and the vacation rental industry really, and was excited about the opportunity. And I joined Beyond and the industry in early 2019, came onto our product team actually, and was really helping with uh, figuring out from our pricing tool what we can learn from other industries, what we can pull in um, for what you know the hotel industry or the airline industry has been through, and what we can learn and what we can continue to innovate in this industry. So I did that um, right when I started at Beyond. You know, started in early 2019, and then by the time we got to uh, a year in in 2020, things changed quite a bit. But thankfully, the the industry um, you know was able to hold its own, and I continued on the revenue management team. And then earlier this year, transitioned into the partnerships role. So I did a lot of work um, speaking engagements in person to to really educate the industry on revenue management and best practices. And I find that's where I'm passionate. So it it really led me to leading partnerships here at Beyond, which I'm very excited to do now. Just like you are, I always enjoy hearing where people got started. And and quite quite often, you know, when I'm talking to property managers, it's they, they had one property and that was what ignited the passion. But certainly in my review of the the little I know of revenue management, there there was a lot going on in the hotel industry way, way, way before it got to vacation rentals. So I I can see why 
your expertise is is being put to good use uh, beyond right now. So I just want to kick off with the difference or definition of revenue management and dynamic pricing. And what is the difference if there is a difference? Because I hear those two terms being bandied around a lot. Absolutely. And this is my favorite question, to be honest. I don't even think I knew you were going to ask this, but it is truly my favorite question because it's really where we need to start as an industry and defining what these terms are. So I always like to say there's a lot more to revenue management than just dynamic pricing. Revenue management is this broader umbrella and and pricing falls under that for sure. Um, But there's so much more that goes into revenue management. So to define revenue management in this industry, I think if you're a property manager or an owner or a host, if you want to figure out what sort of should fall in your revenue management scope, go through and try to book your property like a guest would. I know a lot of people do this to try to see that flow, but figure out how people find your properties, end up booking them, explore them, um, and go through that flow and, and understand what the guest is seeing. Now, revenue management and your strategy should be able to touch every single point along that guest journey. So one of the reasons why guests often book is price. It's a pretty popular reason why people book. It matches what price they want to pay and they like the listing. But it's not the only thing. You have to make sure your photos look great. If it's the winter, is your featured photo a covered pool or a nice fireplace? Do you have great reviews? Do you have good content? Uh, Are your listings and properties actually being sold in the place where the booking audience is? Are you distributing to multiple channels? These are all questions that are part of that revenue management strategy, um, where it's not only just pricing. I think dynamic pricing and and a really solid pricing strategy is the foundation of your revenue management strategy. And then you build from there. There's so much more to to really focus on and and adjust in your strategy that really is the idea of revenue management. It It sounds like revenue management is the sort of overarching view of your business as a whole. And as you say, the customer journey from from finding you all the way through. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You, I guess. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And and really, it it is getting people to to book your listings is kind of the main goal here. So, mm-hmm. revenue management is, I'm you know, we're starting to see it elevate in the industry as a whole because it's important, and we're starting to define things that maybe look like just marketing beforehand or you know operations beforehand that are truly actually revenue management because they ultimately impact who's booking your property when. Mhm. No, no that's that's interesting because I and and that makes a very nice distinction and I haven't heard it really explained in that in those simple terms before for me. <laughs> so 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 thank you that um you know that, that's something I can take back to my team. And I actually talk to them about you know how important some of those other things that they do as a matter of course anyway, but letting them know that they're contributing to that whole strategy, which is revenue management. Yeah, absolutely. And I also always like to say you're you're already kind of doing everything to a certain mm-hmm. extent. Whether you're you know you own your own business and you you do everything from start to finish, you're already doing all of this and and doing revenue management. It's just a matter of making sure that you have this strategy organized. And you're actually, you know, touching on the right points and making the right changes, but also letting everything talk to each other. If you work at a bigger property manager and you maybe have a couple of people on the team, somebody's in charge of marketing and operations, somebody's in charge of pricing and, and owner relationships, maybe, is your pricing strategy talking to your marketing strategy? That's something that will really strengthen your revenue management strategy. And, and I think thinking about it in that way and, and really just putting the time and effort into focusing and, and organizing a strategy is a great step one to, to really building out your, your revenue management strategy here. Well, I, th- I think, you know, when I started out and we we're talking about my role as CEO of a property management company in Ontario, there's a lot of us in Ontario. We have not been operating much else than the standard set it and forget it type of, and I, I, I can't say strategy because it's not, <laughs> it really is not a strategy at all. You know, we, we, we come to the beginning of the booking season, perhaps in September, October, we speak to our owners and we set the pricing for the next year. And I, I think the last two years of COVID have showed us that there's, there's so much more scope than than that, uh, and yeah. I know this should have happened years ago, but it it really brought it home. And you know, one example was um, cancellations, and we had so we, and demand was massive both in 2020 and 2021, 
because we were locked down until June in both years. Mm-hmm. And then June opened and everybody, the demand for, to get out of the city was, was huge. But we were also experiencing all the cancellations at the same time from people who'd booked the year before and now were too nervous to travel at all. So right. we just adopted this manual process of, wow, this, this property was 2,500 a week a year ago in 2019. But I know with the, with the way that prices are going, we could put 28, 3,000 on it. And then we would post that and see that that booking was, was taken within minutes of posting. Yeah. And, you know, I hate to say, oh my gosh, that was, that was an eye opener, but it actually, actually was because we hadn't really done anything like that before. So mm-hmm. we saw then and there that we needed to improve our current pricing strategy. Are you seeing a, that, that there are still uh, pockets like we, we have in Ontario where managers and perhaps owners are not adopting uh, a strategy, a pricing strategy at all? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there there is still a version to change in your pricing strategy. I think there are so many property management companies that have been around for so long now, even way before we had any sort of dynamic pricing tool or revenue management tool or really technology and software in the industry that, you know, going back to your point, set it and forget it is a strategy, you know, and it has worked for people for many years. And to a certain extent, if it isn't broke, why fix it? To that, I would say, you know, is there that opportunity in your market to, like you said, post COVID or even before COVID, increase your rates with what demand actually looks like in your market? So the thing about the set it and forget it mentality is it entirely relies on what you've seen in the past. So you know high season, you know low season, you know your big events, you know your demand drivers. That's all great and should factor into your strategy. But what's happening in the future? Because COVID definitely showed us that forward-looking things can change really quickly and you can't rely on that historical data anymore. I always say if you had set your, your pricing strategy at the beginning of 2020 for summer 2020 and didn't change anything and got booked up super quick um, and didn't react to any of the demand that came in Ontario for June, you sold out too quickly, left money on the table, and ultimately didn't react. You definitely boosted your occupancy. Owners are probably happy because they got some bookings, but there are probably other people in your market that got you know 5000 for a week instead of 2500 mm-hmm. um, because they were able to look ahead and say, ooh, I'm really seeing something start to pick up here in the future. I, I know guests want to come to my market and there are only so many places they can stay. I can increase my prices quite a bit in those periods of high demand. So we, we definitely do come across uh, people even today that, that are you know, averse to a dynamic pricing strategy. But at Beyond, we were the first ones to bring it to the industry. So we have eight plus years of experience now educating people on the why. And the best way that we do that is getting people to start with one property. And we get that one booking for 4th of July or Christmas or New Year's Eve or something that shows them, wow, okay, especially in periods of high demand, I can I can make some real money with this tool. So usually that's sort of the best way to show because you know a, a flat pricing strategy has worked for so many years and you really got to see the revenue come in from a dynamic pricing strategy right off the bat. So, so what could managers do to start with? What are the first steps? I would say if you're coming from that flat pricing strategy, really get an understanding of uh, what's going on in your market for the future. So try to figure out where you can get this data. Uh, I think a couple of years ago, it was maybe more difficult or more expensive to get. But right now, you can even use our insights tool for free. Uh, we don't charge for it at all. You can connect and get all your market data right in there to see what's going on this upcoming summer or next winter and what people are already booking. So start there and get an understanding for what's going on in your market ahead of time and start being able to read the tea leaves a little bit in, in terms of even just occupancy or supplied uh, data for your market and, and get an understanding there. And then I think that'll really help bridge the gap to, okay, I can start using this for my future prices and actually incorporate this into my strategy a little bit more. So I think getting that data and, and starting to read it on a regular basis is pretty key. But even more high level, I think just make sure you're setting aside time on a regular, consistent, routine basis to look at what's going on for your own listings and your market. You know, we I speak to so many people who have a good revenue management or pricing strategy and flow and process, but it's it's maybe inconsistent or there's pieces missing or they're not really reviewing changes that they made or anything like that. So 
pick a day of the week, honestly, sit down for 20, 30 minutes and just get comfortable and, and get into a process of reviewing, okay, what happened since the last time I looked at this? Evaluate what happened there, make some changes, get everything you know down, and then come back the next week and see what happened. Start there and at least start owning your strategy. And, and I bet you'll start to pick up on quick wins that you can change or things that you can test out to, to ultimately make more money. Um, I love the idea of using Beyond Insights, but uh, also, and I and I think we're, we're we're constantly finding new things in our property management software that delivers yeah. reports, delivers this information uh, that we never knew we had. You know, because we we weren't really looking for anything in particular. But I understand that we most people who are using a good property management system, the software, will find some good data in there to help them out. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd say that the key there is um, making sure that your own historical portfolio listing data you have. If you don't have that historical data saved or accessible or you know at your fingertips, that's going to be a, a huge loss in the future because as I mentioned earlier, you know, historical historical data and, and the context that you have in your market and your listing is super important, but you do have to fold in the market data too. So Make sure you have that historical data and have all your listing information easily accessible in your property management system. I think that's a pretty easy ask for most PMSs. Um, but also make sure that you're getting that market data because people who are coming to your market aren't just going straight to your website or straight to your listings or calling you up and, and directly getting to you. They're, they're looking at the entire market and seeing what's available. So you want eyes on that in, in some aspect too. And there are a couple of different ways to, to go about getting that as well. So, so tell me about repeat guests. You know, we, we have probably 50% of, of our guests are repeat, uh, not necessarily going back to the same property, but there's a large number who do come back year on year on year to the same property. And how do we deal with that? We, we often have them say, you know, can we have a discount? Because we, we've been multi-year repeat guests. And, and our view is naturally that we are going to, the owner is going to rent these weeks, regardless of whether it's to you, dear repeat guest, or it's to a new guest. And we'd quite like to get some new guests in as well, because they will ultimately become repeat guests too. So, so we are dealing with this, you know, usually September, October time, people have had the vacation, they want to book for next year. How should we respond to that? What's the best way of, of fitting repeat guests into a pricing strategy? Yeah, you know, I think post COVID now, it, it's, it's sort of a more interesting conversation because we had so many instances where people were able to see so many big increases year over year in rate or revenue for individual properties. So I would always fall back on just your, your revenue management strategy and, and sort of the basics here. So uh, if I'm selling my property for the next 365 days, my calendar is open for the next year. I know realistically, nobody outside of repeat guests is really booking in my market or in my properties a year out. You can get some of that booking lead time data from your, your PMS or from the market data provider to be able to see when people are booking. But for urban markets, you know, average uh, booking lead time is anywhere between two and seven days. For maybe more drive to destination markets, it's a couple of weeks. For something like Hawaii, it's more a couple of months. So it's never really 365 days. So I always say, test out some pretty high prices in your pricing strategy a year, you know, 10, 11, 12 months out in advance and just kind of see what's out there. If someone's going to tie up your inventory a year in advance, they should be paying a premium. Now, I understand that that's a difficult conversation to have with repeat guests, but I think most people do understand year over year, you're growing your business. We can talk about inflation, Everybody understands that. I think if you're trying to increase your rates 40, 50, 60% year over year, a year out, repeat guests might be a little, a little out of tune with that. But I think it's important to have that pricing strategy posted and out there so that people can actually see how you're valuing that inventory ahead of time. Communicate that to repeat guests and then use that pricing increase to give them that discount. So it, it almost falls back on sort of the, the guest relations aspect and saying, I value you as a repeat guest. I value your business. Here's the discount that I'm giving you. Please understand that this is a year in advance. We've seen such crazy demand. I mean, I think most consumers right now are, are pretty accustomed to seeing some high airline prices, some high uh, short-term rental prices. So it's not completely unheard of. And I think as we move out of this crazy pent-up demand period, we'll see more natural year-over-year -year increases like we saw in 17, 18, 19 that people will be more accustomed to. But I think it's important to you know 
not get a lower rate year over year. That's super key, obviously. So build it into your pricing strategy, build those higher prices farther out in advance for new guests, especially because they're they're booking your inventory and tying things up a year in advance. And then also make sure that you're you're sort of you know falling back on those guest relation pieces to make sure that repeat guests feel valued and actually see that discount come through. So that that would be my advice on that. But again, I, I think it's it's crazy to to book a year out. Imagine if you booked, you know, summer 2021, a year out, and all of a sudden we had a rush of demand, but you're already 75% sold out for the entire summer. And now you're losing out on all that money. So much can change within a year. That's what we learned over the past two years. So really protect that inventory farther in advance and, and make sure you keep that in your pocket with some high prices. That's some great suggestions. Thank you. And I want to sort of continue in this theme because, you know, when you've got repeat guests, You've got owners who like these repeat guests. So really, this is a segue into the the whole topic of communicating with owners and helping them understand what revenue management is and the the expectations of occupancy that they have. And perhaps, you know, from what you were just saying, that it's okay to wait till late. You know, you don't have to have your summer booked 10 months in advance. It's okay to wait, but we do. I know we do have some of these discussions with with owners who have repeat guests, and they, you know, they, they don't want those guests to feel they're being gouged in any way. Um, so we have to have, you know, the owner. The, the conversation has to be with owners as well as guests. Do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this this um, kind of references the the broader topic of as a property manager, you are absolutely managing the guest experience and handling that, but almost even more, you're managing your owners. You want to keep your owners long-term. That is much more valuable than one guest or even a repeat guest coming in. So being in tune with what your owners want and how they value your success is super, super important. And if, if an aspect of that is making sure that repeat guests are happy or that they're booked 10 months in advance, then you have to do what you have to do to keep your owners. I think over time, I've worked with with property managers using Beyond and sort of this this issue with communicating to owners. I think over time, you can kind of chip away and really use revenue growth as a way to to prove your point and prove your strategy with owners. Some owners, you know, are are going to be stuck in their ways. They are going to want to maintain their strategy and and maybe take repeat guests and not see. A, you know, crazy year over year growth and rate or, or not wait until two months out to, to book their entire high season or something like that. So you always have to take that with a grain of salt and really value what your owners want to do. But I think over time, you can sort of chip away um, with some education. I think the education piece really is all built around you as a property manager, aligning your strategy with an owner. So most owners, you know, I think are going to be pretty receptive to things like pricing, average daily rate, how occupied am I for a given month, um, and then also pulling in historical context too. So I think leaning on all of that to, to help further what you're doing from a strategic standpoint is super important. One thing we've built in beyond is easy ways for property managers to, to, property managers to leverage some of our tools and reporting to really just send out directly to owners and say, hey, we are handling this. Here are our goals. Here's how we're going about it. If you have any questions, let us know. And they can sort of manage owners from there. But I think aligning on a lot of these metrics is super, super key. And just educating owners on what we're trying to do. I think one of the most dangerous things is when an owner sort of judges your revenue management strategy on something that's outside of the property manager's control. So something like a maintenance block or an owner stay comes up a lot with whoa, 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 I made much less you know, last July than I did the July previous. Uh, what's the reason? I'm not, I'm not really seeing the reason. From a property manager standpoint, revenue might be down, occupancy might be down, ADR might be down, but they blocked off half the month for an owner stay. So you need to be able to, to have a good metric or a good way to, to communicate that to the owner. And I think that's why we're putting a big emphasis on revenue per available night, which really takes into account what you truly have to sell from an available inventory standpoint to your entire market. So being able to say, okay, removing all owner stays or maintenance blocks, kind of everything equal year over year, we actually grew you know, your listings revenue by being able to, to look at that. So something like revenue per available night isn't going to be feasible to every single owner, but I think it's good to think in that way and sort of align your strategy 
um, and put in the time to educate them through materials and resources as best as you can to, to get their buy-in essentially. But going back to my first point again, you really have owner management is, is a huge piece of this business and you've got to keep them happy long-term. So if, if they're really stuck in their ways about, you know, I want to be booked this far in advance, I want a 5% year over year growth and not 25, like some of your owners are seeing with a more lax strategy, um, then that's okay. You have to keep your owners happy and, and that's it at the end of the day. But I think you can over time chip away at some of this, um, at some of those more hard to do owners and, and show them, hey, give me some flexibility here. I will put more money in your pocket. That's kind of the only way to win here in my eyes. You mentioned um, education through perhaps resources and material. And I'm thinking that this is this should be something that, that's right up front in the owner acquisition process when you're acquiring an owner, sharing that information with them. What, what types of resources and, and educational material are you referring to? So I think it's important to start with all the internal data that you have. So in Beyond, we have something that's a, a listing level statistics page. So you can see a quick view of the past three years, monthly ADR, occupancy, revenue. So that's pretty much if I need to quickly diagnose a property, I am looking at those metrics. It's only that listing. It's only what's happened there. That gives me 100% what I need to know about a property. For owner acquisition, you're looking at something more like a projection or what what would you what could this owner expect and how can you get their buy-in? I think when you're looking at something like projections, oftentimes I see a lot of uh, projection tools that throw out just a, a flat revenue number or something like that. But I think from that projection standpoint, you have to start there with the potential owner um, on educating them with ADR occupancy and revenue. You've got to break out those metrics from the start and say, this is how we look at things. It's not just a flat revenue, you know, gross revenue for the year. Start just building those metrics from the beginning and, and get their buy-in and, and start educating there even before they're one of your owners. So that's something that, that we like to use. Um, that's all internal data. But I think what's also cool is when you're doing projections, you often don't have that internal data, right? So you kind of lean on what's going on in the market. And that's also where you can intro the owner to um, really valuing market data. So that's something that helps in owner communications as well. Um, let's say a, a property isn't doing well and an owner is upset, um, or I, I guess I should say isn't doing well in their mind. Maybe occupancy is down or they didn't get booked for, for a couple of days in the month. Then you can flip to this market data and, and sort of show them, hey, compared to all your other competitor owners in the market, we're actually doing a lot better. And that's that comparison that can really help you out in the, in the long run too. But yeah, I, I would really start with the internal data, get their buy-in um, with those metrics, even before they're your owner with the projections, and then be able to fold in the market data as well from the beginning to, to just introduce it to them and, and be able to have that in your back pocket. Because any good revenue management strategy is really focusing on what's going on in the market, comparing to the market, because ultimately that's who you're trying to beat and that's where your guests are. So would we'll definitely start there and make sure that's all at your fingertips. Yeah, certainly uh, this this year, let's say since August 2021 through to this year, we've seen a massive influx of of new owners looking to rent out. You know, that they're they're paying significantly more for their property than they were doing in 2019. Yeah. And you know, it's just just the same in our neck of the woods as it is everywhere else. Um so rental is part of their investment strategy as it probably wasn't even if they're buying for family purposes but we are seeing more pure investors coming in that are asking for this information right up front first thing they say is you know here here's an mls number what am i going to get for this and and if we don't have that information up front we're not going to win that uh, that that new owner yeah absolutely so i think it's it's important to have all that and to be able to understand really how you go about projecting revenue like that. I think every property manager is always a little bit cautious. You know, you, you don't want to go too high on the projection. You also don't want to go too low. So sort of, you know, what do you fold in here? And I think as a property manager, as a revenue manager, that's where you really need to have your pulse on what's going on in the market. I would say heading into this year, you know, I'm talking to a lot of owners right now where we sort of need to prep them for, hey, summer 2020 was great. Summer 2021 was even better. This year, things might kind of start to even out. How do we set expectations that some ADRs might come in below previous years in some markets? There's, there's more supply, there's 
there's more guests um, traveling internationally or traveling back to hotels and resorts. So how do we sort of start to prepare owners to be ready for what's coming down the line this year? And you have to understand what's going on in the market and be able to read those red or green flags ahead of time. And that comes into projections and, and also just, just sort of protecting um, what you're doing here. But again, from the, the investment standpoint, a lot of these new investors in the industry are really responsive to things like ADR, occupancy, and revenue. If they're buying an investment property and it's not a family home that's that's been with them for 50 plus years, they're probably more interested in how can I make money? What data should I be looking towards? What can I sort of uh, forecast here even? So that's something that I found with a lot of these new owners works really well to, to give them this easy data up front. If they want more, if they want less, it's, pre- it's pretty easy to go from there. But a lot of them are receptive to learning about the industry. Yeah, so certainly what we're seeing. I just want to uh, address uh, address some of the myths of dynamic pricing. There was a great uh, blog post, I think, on the on the Beyond blog, and I have to say that that blog has so much learning in there on on a variety of topics, not just dynamic pricing. So I'd encourage anybody to go to the blog and and read some of those articles. But I was reading one about myths uh, of dynamic pricing. For example, you know, I've I've, I've seen the perceptions from guests who say it's price gouging. If prices go up and down, you know, I, I look just like I was booking booking a flight to Germany in the summer and found my flight, left it two days. When I went back, it had gone up by nearly 25% because obviously everybody else was out there looking for flights on, on those same days. So I don't see that as price gouging. It's just simply supply and demand. But I'm, but I'm seeing, I'm hearing from from people that you know all you're gouging because that price of that property was half what you're charging now three years ago. Yeah, to, to that point, I would say if it looks like price gouging, you probably are are looking at a bad pricing algorithm. Price gouging to me is really overcharging for necessities, which can include accommodations in times of natural disasters or things like that, and it definitely comes into play. Um, but to your point. Really, from a revenue management standpoint, what we're trying to align and what we're trying to find is the highest guest with the highest willingness to pay. That's all that we're reading. I think if you look at Beyond's pricing algorithm, we also surface uh, the data that we're pulling from the market to sort of power our engine. You can see exactly where we're getting our price increases from. You can see why we're increasing maybe a price 30% over last year's prices because it's far in advance and the market's already 75% booked. There's only so much left. We're not necessarily price gouging, and, and I would challenge anybody to find something shocking like a, you know even a, a thousand percent increase year over year or something like that that isn't just a true error. So I think we we really spell it out in a way that that sort of makes it easy to understand what guests are looking for in the market and what's left for them to buy. It's it's the same thing that you see again with airlines and hotels, and I think that's also the the really interesting thing that we're seeing come from other. Uh, hospitality industries. The airline industry kind of perfected this and did a lot of lifting from a guest education standpoint to really expect, hey, I I could be looking in periods of low demand for a cheaper rate. That's out there. That's available. There's a low season in every market. Go to a, a Tuesday in, in uh, you know some rural destination market and you're probably going to get the lowest rate. That's always available to a guest. So um, I think the airline industry, the hotel industry has done a great job educating that and You know, we're seeing these practices evolve, uh, not only in short-term rentals, but also long-term rentals, things like uh, parking, events, anything that's really ticketed and and anything that's sort of a a perishable inventory falls under this category. So, you know, you might see something that looks like price gouging for your highest event in your market, but really it's just being aligned with supply and demand that you should also be able to see from wherever that price is coming from. And it should make sense in your mind uh, if you think about it. But it's, it's always about offering, you know, sort of the high end and the low end. And that's where we ultimately maximize revenue. And that's where dynamic pricing really comes into play compared to something like a flat pricing strategy too. So some of those increases can be uncomfortable, but they should be pretty easy to figure out the why that's behind that. Um, if you don't have that, then you might not be using, using the right tool or looking at the right data. Uh, but being able to see that that sort of breakdown is super and super important in educating not only for yourself as a property manager, but making sure your guests also sort of expect that too. You know, we're reading what's going on in the market because guests are actually getting a search result page of everything in that market. So that's all that's really, really going on. But um, yeah, I would I would fall on the, the market data for sure to, to take a look and 
deep dive into what's going on. Um, but really, everything should be spelled out, spelled out as far as where increases come into play to, to really educate everybody on, on dynamic pricing. So, so just one more. Uh, can you address the myth? And I, and I have heard this from, from, from some networking colleagues that pricing strategies like this are only for the large property management companies. Yeah, I mean, I would say, if anything, these types of pricing strategies are more valuable to somebody who has one or two properties and maybe doesn't have a lot of resources at their fingertips, including time, to be able to to set up a pricing strategy like this. I would say if you're trying to do a dynamic pricing strategy on your own, it is not feasible for somebody with one or two properties because it's probably not their full-time job. That's where a dynamic pricing tool comes into play, where you can easily plug in and have this accessible, understand it, you know, super user-friendly. I mean, we, we built Beyond for hosts initially in San Francisco, for, for small hosts to be able to use and actually be able to pull in market data and have an easier way to have a more advanced strategy. So it's, it's pretty accessible. Um, on our website, you can plug in you know, a direct link from Airbnb or VRBO if you're only selling on one of those channels and actually just see what type of price we would put out there. But very user-friendly, very easy to sort of manage and understand. And we actually have a, a ton of smaller users on Beyond that like using it because we never say set it and forget it. I think it's a very dangerous term when it comes to your revenue management strategy, but you can set things up and you know know that you have a really advanced pricing strategy that you only have to check in maybe a couple times a week or even once a week. So it is really accessible at both levels. I think uh, because a pricing tool really opens up that level of advanced strategy that wasn't possible before 2013, 2014 to those smaller users. Now, what I will say is on the on the other end of the spectrum for larger property managers with, let's say, 50 plus listings, they do have more time, money, resources, and technology to go past dynamic pricing. And this goes back to my point earlier about dynamic pricing is that foundation of your revenue management strategy. And I think it's great that it's, it's accessible to every type of host, owner, or manager. But what we're going to see moving forward in the industry is growth in, in the rest of revenue management and how we can get a better handle from a technology standpoint, from an industry standpoint, on what levers we have to pull here. Larger property managers just have more resources, more time, more people to do that in a more manual way. But at Beyond, our job is to create products and tools that make that accessible for everybody. So we did that with dynamic pricing. We're doing it with channel management and direct booking websites. And that's really the next step here. So it's it's very, very accessible for smaller uh, property managers as well. And I think moving forward, that's our main goal to make revenue management accessible and feasible for all. I love that. You know, many of the listeners to this podcast are, are the smaller independent owners um, and perhaps owners of, of anything from one to five to 10 properties. And, and I think they're going to find this super interesting. So you, you've brought us so much information in this conversation, Ryan. We are so, uh, you know, so happy and thankful to welcome Beyond as our next sponsor for the podcast. And over the next 10 weeks, you're going to be joining me every single week to answer a question that has been posed by people who are you know, trying to explore this world of dynamic pricing. So, uh, you know, if, if you've enjoyed what Ryan's been saying, then make sure that you do tune in to the next 10 episodes because we're going to delve a little bit more deeply in a very short space of time, but more deeply into a single question in each episode. So although I'll be interviewing lots of other people, you're going to be hearing Ryan uh, over and over again. And that I'm, I'm sure that will be um, greatly enjoyed by everybody because you've made this very plain and simple. I think, and, and understandable for everybody. So thank you so much for joining me on thank this you. episode. And we will be talking again very soon. Yeah, absolutely. I think we've just scratched the surface here. I'm really excited to chat more about dynamic pricing and revenue management. So super, super excited. But yeah, I hope this was a great overview for everybody and really excited to, to partner with you moving forward. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ryan, from Beyond for joining me and giving such a simple and elegant explanation of dynamic pricing and revenue management. It's a topic that can be very complicated and get people scratching their heads as to, you know, how it all hangs together. And I love the way that Ryan laid it out in a way that made it really understandable. So thank you for that. 
So if you are interested in dynamic pricing, and we absolutely all have to be, over the next 10 weeks, we're going to be hearing more from Ryan. Each week on every episode, he's going to be answering a pressing question from a potential user of dynamic pricing platform about how the system works. And all these questions are coming directly from people doing demos and those interested in really doing it right. So Ryan selected 10 questions that he feels that he can answer in a way that, that are going to help, that's going to help us all out. So each week over the next 10 weeks, you're going to be hearing one of these questions and we will all come away from this completely enlightened. <laughs> I am quite sure. I'm certainly just listening to him today has, uh, has given me renewed motivation and enthusiasm for not leaving the money on the table, which I think has been an issue for us in the past. So thank you so much for spending your time with me today, whether you're out hiking, running, at the gym, on a treadmill, or doing a changeover at a property or sitting in a car or an aeroplane or wherever you are. It's always very gratifying to me to know that what we talk about is, is worthwhile you listening. So thanks again. If you enjoyed this, if you enjoy the podcast and you haven't yet left me a review, you know how you love to have reviews on your properties and on your company. Well, I feel exactly the same and would be very, very grateful if you would go to either iTunes or any of the platforms where you, on, on which you listen to your podcasts and leave me a review. The more reviews we get, the more listeners we get, because it just puts us up the rankings and it's just really, really helpful. And the more listeners we get, the more these great people who come and join me on the podcasts get their episodes listened to. And that's you know, it's really beneficial for them too. And just on that note, if you hear something on an interview or, or on a specific podcast that you want to know more about, please don't hesitate to get in touch with the, with that person that, uh, that I've been talking to. They all tell me. They look forward to personal questions, to, to people who've listened to the podcast, getting in touch with them. And when you do, let them know that you heard about it on Vacation Rental Success. I'd really appreciate that. So that's it for another week. The countdown is now on for me heading back to uh, Ontario, but I've got so many projects on the go for the next few months. I'm really quite looking forward to it now. And of course, the snow will be out of my driveway. So we are not quite counting the days, but definitely anticipating a return to the spring. So I hope you enjoy your day and thanks again for listening. It's been a pleasure as ever being with you. If there's anything you'd like to comment on, then join the conversation on the show notes for the episode at vacationrentalformula.com. We'd love to hear from you. And I look forward to being with you again next week.